I'm going to ask you to stand. Someone asked me the other day, he said, Pastor, why is it that every time you preach, before you read God's word, you ask us to stand? Because when you go to the courtroom, they say, rise, and you rise, and the judge speaks. But the judge here is the word of God. That is our judge. And so we rise to hear what the king of kings has to say through his word. Revelation chapter 3, verse 14 to 19. I'm going to read Revelation 3, verse 14 to 19. If you have your Bibles, turn to it. If you don't have your Bible and you have your phone, turn to it. If you have an iPad, turn to it. Whatever you do, turn to the scriptures. Amen. Revelation 3, verse 14 to 19. If you're there, say, I'm there. And if you're not there, say, wait for me. Okay. <laughs> Revelations 3, 14 to 19. It says, to the angel of the church in Malaysia. No, no, no. <laughs> Laodicea. Right? These are the words of the... These, these are the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. That's not good. Somebody say, ill. That's disgusting. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing, but you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, so you can become rich, and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Be earnest and repent. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus, you help me so that I can find expression in my mind through my spirit. I pray that you will think through my mind and speak through my vocal cords cause the people to understand the word that you have for them this morning. Let us be doers of that word, not hearers. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, oh, it's not morning, actually. It's, it's in the night. Yeah, I, oh, sorry. I've been preaching since morning. So you may take, take your seat, please. Take your seat. Um, amen, amen, amen. Amen. Um, We've been traveling. I've been, I've been, I, I, I was on a plane uh, during Christmas, and it was so difficult for me to come for this conference. I told Danny, I actually told Danny, I said, that you, you, you got to meet me halfway th this time, because it, it, it was, it was, it was hard, because today is my daughter's birthday. Yeah, 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 and my daughter is four, and um, and 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 she is, she has a big mouth and she's feisty. She's not afraid of anybody or anything. Like, like I don't know where she gets that from. I, I name, no, it's not me. It's not me. It's, it's really not me. Uh, I named. I made a mistake of naming her after my mother. Don't tell my mother that. Um, <laughs> and um, and my mother is feisty. So you can only imagine. Um, I am very concerned about the modern day church. And I'm very burdened about the modern day church. Um, one of the things that you will find out is that there are 120 people that are in the upper room in the book of Acts. And before we know it, these 120 people, in a few years we see them to have gone throughout the world and witnessed to many nations and many cities. And when we look at the fire 
of the early church and the first church, we don't see that as the fire that we have in this new church, in the 21st century church. So I want to talk to you about the epidemic of the 21st century church. There is an epidemic that is much more dangerous than any fever you would have thought about. There is an epidemic in the 21st century church that is addictive and is going around and is much more dangerous than Ebola. And that epidemic is the virus of lukewarmness. The 21st century church is lukewarm. And it's an epidemic. You go to a lot of churches today, and most churches, you go to a lot of mega churches, they have more than 120 people. Some mega churches even have 5,000 people, 10,000, 20, 40,000, 50, 60,000. And yet, we can do so little of what the 120 in the book of Acts could do. And the question we should ask ourselves is why? And the reason is because the 21st century church suffers from the sickness of lukewarmness. We are lukewarm. Now, when you go to the doctor, the doctor will give you diagnosis of the sickness that you've got. Now this, tonight, I'm going to give you characteristics of a lukewarm Christian. Characteristics of a lukewarm Christian. And I'm going to believe God with you that as you cross over to next year, that God will heal you and heal the church from the spirit of lukewarm. Because there is an antidote. There is medicine for the lukewarm Christian. And I'll tell you what that is in a second. Watch this. Number one, the first characteristic of a lukewarm Warm Christian is lukewarm people do what is com convenient instead of what is covenant. Lukewarm people do what is convenient instead of what is covenant. Lukewarm people do what is convenient instead of what is covenant. So when you ask them to do something or God asks them to do something, they only do it if it's convenient. They come to church when it's convenient. They give when it's convenient. They tithe when it's convenient. They pray when it's convenient. And if you're like that, know that you suffer from lukewarmness. Because that's what lukewarm Christians do. They only do things that are convenient for them. Not what is covenant. Now let me ask you a question. If you have a son or a daughter, you do not pay their tuition in school because it is convenient. You pay it because you have a relationship, a covenant with that child. And you pay it even if it is difficult times. And that's the same way our our relationship with God is supposed to be. We don't relate to God based on convenience. If it was convenience, I would have never come here. Lukewarm Christians only obey God when it's convenient for them to do it. They don't trust God. They don't believe in covenant. Only if it's convenient. If we did things out of convenience, nobody would get saved. Nobody will be blessed. 
But we have a church full of people that don't understand covenant. They only do things out of convenience. I got plenty in my church. There's none in Malaysia. They don't exist. Number two, lukewarm. You know what? Let me, let me read this scripture. First, First Chronicles 21 verse 24. This is what David says. David says, but the Bible says, but King David said to Ornan, no, but I will buy them for the full price. I will not take for the Lord what, what is yours, nor offer burnt offerings that cost me nothing. David said, I will not give God anything that does not cost me. In other words, if I'm going to do something for God, it has to cost me. That's a person that has a covenant with God. When you don't have a covenant with God, you do anything that is convenient. It's just got to be easy. Tell somebody, I'm not a lukewarm Christian. Is, even if you are, tell them I'm not a lukewarm Christian. Tell them I refuse to be a lukewarm Christian. Number two, two lukewarm people tend to choose what is popular over what is right. They tend to choose what is popular or what is famous, or what is trending, instead of what is right. So, Matthew 23, verse 5 to 7 says, They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their, bro they make their, their, their let me read 6, and they love the place, of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogue and greetings in the marketplace being called rabbi by others. They like what the public thinks about them. They care about what other people think much more than what God thinks. They do things that is popular, that is well known, well accepted by others, but they don't do what is right. Are you a lukewarm Christian? Don't do what is right. Number three. I'm going to be quick here. Number three. Lukewarm people call radical what Jesus expects of all his followers. Lukewarm people call radical what Jesus expects of all his followers. They'll see you going for evangelism and outreach and they'll say, ooh, he's so radical. That's what Jesus asks us to do. That is not radical. They'll see somebody go down on their knees and they're praying. Ooh, ooh, ooh. How's man fire? He's so radical. That is not radical. That is just what God asks all of us to do. They call normal Christianity radical Christianity. Because they think that uh, it, it's just, oh, they just come to church and uh, they sit down and then they see somebody worshiping the Lord and they're lifting up their hands and bowing face down. It's like, ooh, wow, he, very, uh, that uh, lady, very radical. She's not radical. She's obeying scripture. But you think it's radical because you're lukewarm. And if you hang along with them long enough, you also become lukewarm. Sometimes you are in church and you lift up your hands and you're praising God and lukewarm people look at you like, why is, he, why, why is she crying? Nobody died. Hey, are you okay? Are you okay? Did you, did, you, uh, did you eat before you came up? Do you have money? Why are you crying? 
They don't understand that you're crying because you're over before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and you're worshiping. And that's how, that's how, that's just how normal Christians behave. It's not radical. It's normal. It's not radical. You've not died for Jesus yet. That is radical. You've not gone to another country where they arrested you and they whipped you on your back and then all of a sudden you picked up a microphone and you start preaching again. That is radical. But evangelism outreach just to witness to, to the person you work with and that's radical? Come on. That is not radical. And if you're a lukewarm Christian, you're sitting down looking at me right now, how I'm preaching, is like, he's very radical. This is not radical. It's just normal Christianity. It's a normal person on fire for the Lord. If you're normal on fire for the Lord, that is just how it is. But we have so many lukewarm Christians in the body of Christ that it starts to make you look weird. They, they are making us, they are making you who's on fire for the Lord look weird. And now people who are on fire for the Lord are not even comfortable in church anymore. Can you imagine that? Imagine that. We, you can't even be comfortable in church. Imagine the world. The world has got so much in the church and we become so lukewarm that even if you're on fire for the Lord, you, you can't stay in the church. The church is too, it's too, it's too lukewarm for radical Christians. They're missing in the body of Christ. They are rare species. What number am I on? Number four. Lukewarm people measure their morality or goodness by comparing themselves to sec the secular world and other Christians who are not doing so well. Uh-oh. 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 Are you testing yourself yet? Are, are you, are you, uh, ask the person sitting next to you. Are you lukewarm? Are you, are you lukewarm? Are you look, are you lukewarm? Look, 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 at, look, look at the person standing. And if they don't look at you, uh, they're guilty. Because lukewarm people, the Bible says if we compare ourselves with ourselves, we're not wise. You know what lukewarm people do? They look for the Christians in the church that are not doing well and say, oh, well, he's an elder in the church, but, you know, he doesn't come for prayer meeting. So what? Oh, but he's a pastor. But he doesn't do that. So it's okay if I don't do that. Is the pastor your measurement? Are you going to stand before the Lord and tell them, well, <laughs> well, I disobeyed you because my pastor disobeyed you and I think it's okay. It doesn't work like that. The Bible talks about the tax collector. And the Bible talks about Luke 18, 11 to 12. The Pharisee standing by himself prayed, thus he says, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortionists, unjust, adulterous, or even like that tax collector. And this is a Pharisee. Now, if you're a Pharisee, it meant that religiously or in the Jewish community, you were higher than a tax collector. Most tax collectors were non-believers. So can you imagine... Him comparing himself to a tax collector. Oh, you are so shameful. 
I thought you would compare yourself with Jesus. Why didn't they compare themselves with Jesus? Why didn't they say, oh, you know what? I'm a tax, I'm a Pharisee, I'm comparing myself to Jesus. That standard was too high for them. Lukewarm Christians like to lower the standard. So that they look good. And you know what? They're the gossips of the church. Uh-oh. Oh, oh, there's nobody here like that. I'm not talking about anyone in this church. No, it only exists in my church. I'm only preaching what I've seen in Ghana, okay? It's not in Malaysia. It doesn't exist here. Everybody in glad tidings, it's, it's pure, perfect, and holy. I'm just talking from Ghana, okay? They're the gossips of the church. Because they think that the more they make someone look bad, it looks good on them. But the fact that you talked about someone and said, oh, this guy, he's so bad, it don't make you any better. But in your mind, you think, because you made someone look bad, you look any better. You don't look any better. You're still that liar. Okay? It's not, it's not changed. It's still you. But that's what lukewarm Christians do. And I'm telling you, it's an epidemic everywhere. You go to Ghana, lukewarm Christians do that. You go to America, lukewarm Christians do that. You go to Philippines, lukewarm Christians do that. You go to Japan, lukewarm Christians do that. Because it's the same devil everywhere. If you have cancer or you have diabetes... The characteristics of diabetes is the, is the same. Whether you're in Malaysia, whether you're in Pakistan, whether you're in Bangladesh, it's the same. Lukewarm. Number five. Uh-oh. Oh, you thought I was done. I got a long list here. <laughs> you have not escaped yet. Number five, lukewarm people say they love Jesus, yet he is not allowed to control their lives. They say they love Jesus, but he can't be the Lord over my life. So they come to church and say, I love Jesus. I love Jesus. I love you. All of my heart is for you. Jesus Christ, take some of my life and not all of it. And I love you. Yeah. Lord, I give you some of my life. That's lukewarm Christians. They claim they love Jesus. Jesus is everything. Jesus is their savior, but he can't control their stuff. He can't be Lord over their lives. So they they don't want Jesus to be Lord over their lives. They don't want him to be Lord over their money. Uh Uh-oh. Did I say say something? Uh, 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 uh. Their money. You dare not talk about money in the church as a pastor. You, you, you better not. Look who I'm Christians. Get mad. They don't want God to control their life. If God calls their children into the ministry to full time, they get mad. Oh, I was, I was trying to make my son a lawyer. Why, you, 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 you going to make him a pastor? No. I serve God. My son serves me. (laughs) I know a lot of Christians like that. Their kids want to enter the ministry because they are so lukewarm. They don't want, no, 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 no. No, you know, I have great plans for you. You know, I, agree, but I was planning to take my daughter to Harvard. You know, no, 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 not this. No, 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 
No, missionary to where? Miss, what missionary? No, no, Lord, no. I don't want my child to be a missionary. No. Look, warm Christians. When God called me into the ministry, you know what my mother said? One day I heard my mother praying. She said, Lord, I thank you that in all my life when I was in the nightclubs, you were not ashamed to save me and call me your child. And you did not end there. You looked at me and you were not ashamed to take my child and say he should serve you. I appreciate that. And I saw her pray and began to weep. But lukewarm Christians, huh, they want God to control their life. No. They come to church, oh, I love you, I love you. I I thank God God does not have a hammer in heaven. And I thank God that God is not God, the, God is not the Godfather. Because if he was the Godfather, some of us would have been gone by now. But aren't you glad God is the God of love? Come on, somebody. Aren't you glad God is the God of love? Number six, lukewarm people think about Life on earth. Think of life on earth much more often than life in heaven or than eternity. Lukewarm Christians think of life on earth much more than life in eternity. Everything we see on earth or the materialism one day is going to come to an end. But lukewarm Christians don't seem to realize that. When we are lukewarm as Christians, we think of things on earth much more than things above. That's what Paul said. Set your minds on things above, not things beneath. It's important to make sure your children go to school. It's important to make sure that you do well at your workplace, but in all that thinking, you better think about eternity. In all that thinking, you better think about where you're going to spend the rest of your life when you are no longer on this earth. I know you're worried about paying your bills. But there's something much more worrying about paying your bills. It's where you spend eternity. And lukewarm Christians only seem to think about what is happening here. Set your mind on things above, not things beneath. I don't want to be a lukewarm Christian. Lastly, number seven. I actually have about 15 characteristics. But I'm just going to stop at seven. Because it's a perfect number. And because there are not that many lukewarm Christians in Malaysia. Lukewarm people do not live by faith. Their lives are structured so they don't have to. Listen carefully to me. Lukewarm Christians don't live by faith. Now the Bible says the just shall live by faith. In other words, the righteous shall live by faith. In other words, the Christian shall live by faith. If you're a believer, you are supposed to live a life of faith. Everything about us as Christians is faith. Your salvation is based on faith. Everything we do here is faith. We give by faith. We worship by faith. All that we do is based on faith. Anything done outside of faith, the Bible says, is even a sin. Lukewarm Christians don't want to live by faith. 
Their life is so structured, they don't think they need faith for anything. And there are certain things that you got to use your faith. Sometimes God will allow some things to come your way and you got to learn how to use your faith. Sometimes God will intentionally allow some things to delay so that you can just use your faith. And that is where lukewarm Christians are found wanting. When lukewarm Christians face difficult circumstances, they show how much they don't trust and believe in God. But when a true Christian faces a time of difficulty, their faith comes out. And there are many people in the church today that are lukewarm. They don't have any faith. Just shall live by faith. I don't want to be a lukewarm Christian. I want to be a true believer. Listen to me. The early church in the book of Acts was not lukewarm. The beginning of the church was not lukewarm. So lukewarmness is not a part of the church. What is the remedy for lukewarmness? The only medicine for a lukewarm church is fire. The only remedy for a lukewarm church is the fire of the Holy Spirit. You shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. The only remedy for the lukewarm church is fire. A church that has no fire or a Christian that has no fire will be lukewarm. No fire, lukewarm. If your fire is gone, you are likely to be lukewarm. And I don't want to be lukewarm. So I pray to God to give me the fire. I say, Lord, give me the fire. I don't want to be a nominal Christian. I don't want to be a lukewarm Christian. I want the fire of the Holy Spirit. I want the fire of the living God. I don't want to be a normal Christian. I want to be a Christian who is on fire for the Lord. only medicine for a lukewarm Christian is the fire of God. If you don't have the fire of God, you are going to be lukewarm. If you don't have the fire of God, you wouldn't like to come to church. You don't like to pray. You don't like to do anything that has to do with the things of God because you're lukewarm. Have you ever met a true Manchester United supporter? Uh, some of you don't know what I'm talking about. Have you ever met? I was at the stadium once and when Manchester United was playing with Arsenal, Oh, boy. Uh, those people are not lukewarm supporters. I'm telling you, I'm talking about real support. All of you, I'm sitting in the stadium, and all you hear is, Manjo, we love you. Manjo, we love you. Manjo, we love you. Manjo, we love you. Manjo. Manjo. And they are so passionate and when you go to England on Sundays the stadiums are more vibrant than the church 
the stadium are more on fire for the church because the enemy has managed to make the church look warm and set the stadium on fire. But I will not be a lukewarm Christian. I refuse. I was telling the young people earlier, I was in the UK in the church, I said, shout. They're looking at me, a bunch of white people. <laughs> saying, uh, you know, Josh, this, this is a black thing. So I kept quiet. I didn't say nothing. We were watching a soccer game. And all of a sudden, their team scored. And all of a sudden, they all went, go, go. I said, hey, shut up. It's a black thing. It's not a black thing. It's an on fire thing. It's a passionate thing. How many of you, you have a daughter, and your daughter is going into the fire, and you say, hey, baby, don't go to the fire. Hey. You say, hey. Why do you say, hey? The passion inside of you for your daughter cannot keep your mouth shut. It's not a black thing. It's a fire thing. It's a passionate thing. The devil is a liar. We need a church that is not lukewarm. That is on fire. Believe it or not, Jesus is coming soon. We don't preach that message no more. But he's coming for a church that is on fire. He's coming for a church that is ready. And a lukewarm church is not ready for the coming of Jesus. You are the church. That fire starts with you. If you get on fire, your family will get on fire. If you get on fire, your ministry will get on fire. If you get on fire, the people around you will get on, on fire. Because fire has a way of spreading. And if I were you, I'll make a decision. As I, as I enter into 2019, I don't want to be a lukewarm Christian. I want to be a Christian on fire for the Lord. Somebody stand to your feet.